<laughs> there we go. Yeah. Thank you, Bethany. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in or showing up for our August oil and gas update. We're talking about June numbers uh, because of the two month delay in reporting. And uh, I think I would have to characterize the Bakken at this point as a sleeping giant. Um, you know, the, the COVID pandemic kind of put the industry to sleep and uh, it, it's struggling somewhat to wake up. Uh, so when we look at some of the numbers, uh, as we talk about it, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about, but uh, crude oil production changed by only 143 barrels a day. That's probably one of the smallest changes I've ever seen. And so um, we thought it was flat last month, but it's flatter yet this month. And um, interestingly enough, natural gas production stayed extremely flat too, uh, less than a million cubic feet a day of change in natural gas production. So uh, that's a little bit encouraging in that uh, it gives us some running room with our infrastructure. Uh, but not a lot, as Justin's been talking about and, and telling people that we've got two years at, at best in terms of running room on natural gas capture infrastructure. And when I get to that point, we'll talk about we're, we're starting to struggle a little bit uh, to, to meet the gas capture requirements. So uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Of course, before we leave crude oil production, we should talk about New Mexico. Uh, we bested them in May by 51,000 barrels a day and in June by it looks like 86,000, but it is very much a neck and neck race and they continue to field three times as many drilling rigs as North Dakota does. So um, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it's just the, the time lag that has us still in second place and we'll see when the July numbers come out because that's looking like it could be the month where uh, um, New Mexico passes us and puts us into third place. Talking about uh, wells waiting on completion, very flat this month, but I, I have a little bit of concern with the data. Uh, we're in the process of that all of the uh, well status is transferred over quite correctly for June. Uh, but I wasn't anticipating a, a big change. Now, as I talk about that, though, uh, we met with one of our top 10 producers and they are adding a frack crew in September and another frack crew before the end of the year. So even though uh, their mother corporation uh, is selling their Haynesville assets, so that might clue you in as to who it is, they've got 5,000 natural gas wells in Arkansas that they're putting on the market. And uh, they've indicated that the majority of the cash from that is going to go into their West Africa and Permian Basin operations, but uh, some of it may end up here in the Bakken. They, they still like the Bakken pretty well. And so they will not uh, work on their capital budget in terms of drilling rigs until probably between October and December. So around year end, we should hear from that, that very large corporation what their plans are for next year. So in terms of frack crews, uh, 10 running this week, that's our, our nose count. One more gonna be added next month and at least one more uh, in the following quarters. So we are inching our way up towards that count of around 20 that, that we think we need to see for, to begin to see growth in, uh, you know, true growth in oil production. Uh, so we're at 10 and, and we need probably twice that many to really see true growth. But 10 is adequate to keep up with the 22 drilling rigs that we have. So uh, um, that that's an interesting parameter. Great news on the inactive well count, it dropped by over 500. And so uh, we saw, uh, a significant shift in the number of abandoned wells and the number of inactive wells. That goes along with what we've been hearing from the uh, workover rig companies that they've got every rig that they can put people on deployed 
and they are all trying to hire. So there's great demand for workover rigs to keep wells on production, to put in active wells on, and, and to take care of the abandoned well count. So that's good since that was such a problem in 2020. It's nice to see a significant drop in the numbers there. As far as uh, revenue forecast, uh, we're looking great on the completions. We're, we're matching up with the revenue forecast. And revenue forecast. Uh, so state revenues should be very healthy in terms of the uh, oil and gas income from oil extraction tax and gross production tax. Um, on the completion side, we may have found that magic number for holding production flat. Uh, 53 completions in July and 47 in June equals flat production. So I think that matches up very well with what Justin has been telling us that at 50 completions a month, we can hold production flat. But if we want to grow production, we got to get to 60 or 70 and hence the, the need for uh, additional frac crews. But if you're curious about that, you can, he's, he's going to take the mic here in a few minutes and you can ask him uh, about those projections. I don't think he has slides on those, but he's got uh, he's got a lot of information. So uh, I have talked a little bit about new technologies in the uh, completion arena, and uh, it's very frustrating to all of us. We have two oil companies, uh, significant top 10 oil companies that want to invest in this uh, produced water hydraulic fracturing. And we have two service companies, uh, one that's got a technology developed and, and uh, is just waiting to prove it out, but they, uh, they need some automation equipment. And just like the car dealers, they can't get the hardware. So they are a month to a month and a half out on the, uh, the hardware that they need for the electronics to, to really make this work. But they're, it sounds like they're going to proceed with some testing of, of the other equipment, the, the mechanical equipment on some freshwater fracks. So we'll keep you posted on that. And at the first opportunity, when we're, when we're looking at a field test, we'll put something out so that if you guys want to witness that or, or be a part of that, you can. Uh, but we're very frustrated, as are they. Uh, they had hoped to have the uh, freshwater test behind them and have proven that the technology and the mechanics work and by now be um, beginning to implement produced water hydraulic fracturing or produced water transfer. But uh, with the pandemic, the supply chains just got badly broken and uh, nobody is getting electronics hardware like uh, like they would like to. So they they're saying now it could be a month or six weeks before they get that hardware. Um, talk just a little bit about OPEC. Um, let me see. So OPEC has agreed uh, starting in the current month, not back in the month that we're reporting on, but in August uh, to start increasing production 400,000 barrels a day each month. Uh, as you know, the federal administration, the Biden administration called on them to put more oil on the market in order to uh, lower gasoline and diesel prices. Um, I included in my director's cut uh, a quote from the governor's statement. Uh, we are very frustrated with this approach. Uh, it's our take that the administration is doing everything it can to hamper domestic production and then calling on imported oil to lower the price of gasoline. That's not the nature of imported oil, so um, it, it's very frustrating. And I included that along with a, a link to Governor Burgum's statement there uh, about that position. Um, Fort Berthold activity flat as well. Uh, we do see a record number of wells producing, 16,825. And um, I'll just jump from there to, to the fact that uh, U.S. crude oil stocks are very low. They're below average. Uh, world stocks, pretty much supply demand is in balance. And that, that means that that uh, $70 crude oil price is pretty sticky. That, that's uh, it's going to be hard to move it off of that number. Um, lastly, 
uh, or next to last, let's talk gas capture. We lost a percentage statewide and we don't like that. Uh, the Bakken lost a percentage and, and so uh, um, we dropped to 92% capture. The requirement is 91% and uh, again, our issue continues to be on uh, Fort Berthold where, where we're lagging behind the 91%. There are two Fort Berthold operators that look like they're going to have restricted production because they can't meet the uh, um, the requirements. That's Petroshale and Rimrock. So uh, we are now at the point where the commission, in order to make sure that we don't lose that 91%, is is going to have to be limiting production from some operators that um, are are completing wells and and not meeting the 91 percent benchmark uh, so that's discouraging and and it's uh difficult but uh, as we've been talking about we only have 18 to 24 months statewide in terms of gas capture uh capacity and then then we're going to be up against um actual hardware limitations in terms of the gas plants so, and that includes for expansion. That's the Tioga gas plant. Um, I guess the good news there is that uh, in our meetings with the midstreamers, we always talk about the importance of interconnects. And they heard us and they created an interconnect between Hess, Tioga, and Outrigger, uh, the Sorensen plant over on the state line, the, the North Dakota, Montana state line. And so instead of uh, a massive increase in flaring because of the, the outage at the Tauga gas plant, that gas is actually flowing to the outrigger plant and being processed there. So that's one of the benefits of having the gas capture guidance and requirements and the, the constant meetings with these folks. Um, one last thing then. Uh, Bureau of Land Management, the Deputy Secretary of Interior is coming to town Monday morning. I guess you guys probably heard that, Governor or Senator Hoven. Sometimes I refer to him as governor because I work for him in that role. Um, Senator Hoven is hosting the Deputy Secretary of Interior here, and uh, we're going to be talking with him about uh, how important it is to get the BLM lease sales back on track. Uh, it is now too late. Uh, for a third quarter sale. So this will be the third lease sale uh, that they miss. And uh, that is going to add to the impacts. We know of two more tracks that are going to be impacted by dropping that third quarter sale. And uh, those two tracks are located under the Van Hook arm of Lake Sakakawea. So they're going to impact tribal minerals and private minerals and federal minerals and state minerals uh, in, a, in a very big way. Uh, about 23 wells uh, that need to be drilled in that acreage, uh, over $157 million of impact to the state of North Dakota if, if we lose the ability to develop those uh, federal and state minerals out there. And there's one section that's 50% state, 50% federal, uh, that'll be completely stranded. If uh, if it doesn't get leased within the next year, uh, it's going to get spaced out and get stranded and, and it'll never be developed. So uh, we're going to try to impose on Mr. Boudreaux uh, the importance of, of restarting those sales. And of course, we're um, asking the federal court in uh, North Dakota, the district court, uh, to issue a an order requiring that those sales begin again. So that's our report for the month. Um, again, it seems like with a sleeping giant, we have the potential to get back to and above 1.5 million barrels a day. Uh, we have the potential of getting to six or seven billion cubic feet of natural gas production and export and processing a day, uh, but the pandemic put our service companies and our operators to sleep and they're being very disciplined uh, about you know, really ramping up activity. Uh, they're 
paying down debt, they're uh, buying back stock, they're uh, paying back uh, investors on the on the private capital side, and uh, it looks like uh, what they've been telling us that we're not going to see significant rig count increases until next year is is really coming to pass. Now it was announced um, by one of our operators that they are adding a rig uh, in September and another operator announced that they were going to add two rigs uh, in the third and fourth quarter of this year. So, uh, but that only gets us to 25. And at this oil price, we should we should see probably 60 drilling rigs operating. Uh, it would be economic to to drill and, and complete that many wells. So we'll take questions. <laughs> um, you, uh, you know, one of the things that you referenced was the huge uh, drop that we saw in inactive wells. Um, do you have any uh, reasons that you can tell us as to why you think there was such a big drop? Is it just because oil prices are getting strong right now? So um, it, it's a combination of factors. The question was the, the 500 plus uh, well decrease in inactive wells. And um, there are, are two main factors. Uh, one is that uh, we're into the summer months, so we don't have load restrictions and we can freely move workover rigs. Uh, the workover rig count is up. We, we don't track that, but uh, it's reported, I guess, unofficially that it's up significantly and that, you know, they're all trying to hire. So it's only limited by the number of people that they can hire. Uh, primarily, it's oil price and the fact that it's summer and road restrictions are not in effect. And, and we haven't really had any uh, anti-activity, I guess you'd say, weather this summer. We haven't had the kind of wind and thunderstorm and you know uh, violent weather that, that reduces activity. So, um, but primarily, we have that many being completed aren't we going to see maybe an uptick in oil production next month yeah the question was with, with this number of completions uh, shouldn't we see an uptick and i i think yes we will i i have been expecting uh during the summer months that we would would see some back-to-back -back, uh, production increases and uh if we can sustain this 50 plus completions and if we actually you know, see what we're being told, which is the addition of two frat crews, then we should see production start to increase July, August, September. Uh, then we start to get into winter again. So, so we've got, but we've got some, uh, um, some nice runway ahead of us for the next three months. Um, can you talk a little bit about the effects of OPEC um, increasing its production if that, if that um, we see significant increases on OPEC. What are some of the kind of practical consequences here in North Dakota? Yeah, so the question was uh, significant production increases at OPEC. What would the consequences be in North Dakota? And uh, it, it obviously has a, a direct impact on oil prices. And our oil prices are always lower than WTI or LLS or, or Brent uh, because of the transportation differential. So we see a higher impact than uh, folks in, in Texas or Oklahoma or New Mexico would see. So we, we see the most severe impacts. What, what we think would happen would be a, a stalling out of this slow growth. So, uh, you know, we, we're at 22 rigs. We think we can get to 25, uh, maybe a little higher by the end of the year. Uh, we're at 10 frac crews. We think we can get to 15 by the end of the year, uh, but we could lose that that incremental wedge, that that three frac crews and those three or four drilling rigs. Uh, if OPEC were to say double down or, or triple down on that production increase, because we'd see oil prices eroded by five to seven dollars a barrel. So you could you could picture production numbers out of North Dakota starting to go down again or the other way if that happens. Um, my expectation would be that uh, they would be flat to slightly down. Yeah. 
very small decreases to, to flat production. We are seeing uh, greater and greater efficiencies in, in terms of uh, the wells. I think, you know, again, I can't remember the number, but I believe Justin has a slide that shows that uh, the 2021 wells again are exceeding 2020 wells in terms of their productivity by 10 to 20 percent. Around 10 percent better. So, uh, so we're actually seeing that maybe, you know, maybe we can take shave 10 percent off of that 65 wells that we need to complete uh, every month in order to hold or, or in order to grow production. But that still puts us at 60 and, and we're not quite there. Um, one thing I was just curious to ask about, um, uh, I think we've all reported that oil well fire in McKenzie County is out. Um, is there anything that you have learned you know, over the past couple of weeks uh, that's new about you know, what caused that fire or just any interesting updates on that situation? Yeah, the question was the oil well fire that went on for what seemed like a very long time. And uh, is there anything new that we've learned in the last couple of weeks? And the answer would be not much. Um, you know, we were tracking the activity of getting the wells killed and, and getting the fire out. And uh, it, it was a very difficult operation because the wind kept switching. And so they, they had actually three wells on fire on the pad. And uh, every time they would prepare to attack one of the wells, uh, we'd get a shift in the wind and they'd have to pull everybody off the location and think about attacking a different well. And, uh, you know, that takes almost 24 hours to put that planning in place. So what I can tell you is they're required by rule uh, within 10 days of the cleanup to file a, a follow up report with us and we're going to require a, a root cause analysis. So right now Petro Hunt is um, investigating what led to that initial fire, the initial blowout preventer failure. Uh, and, and we know that's what it was. And that's that's as much as we know. So uh, now that the, the wells are safely capped, uh, they can do the cleanup. That, that shouldn't take more until the end of the month. And then within 10 days of that, they have to file uh, a follow-up report. And that follow-up report has to include uh, a root cause analysis. Now, it may be that they, they say, well, we, we sent the BOPs off for, for testing, but we'll, we'll track that and, and keep you posted. We do know that it was a blowout preventer failure. Any more questions? Anything else? We'll move on to Justin. Okay. I teed some things up for you, Justin. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Obviously. In a, a reference to the production is like a drive from Fargo to Grand Forks. Flat. <laughs> but what about going over that bridge? Yeah. <laughs> that one crossing. Well, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Justin Kringstead, director of the North Dakota Pipeline Authority. Uh, a few things to report, just taking a look at production um, around uh, the Williston Basin. Interesting tidbit here. Um, I just saw today that Montana had picked up two rigs. Um, so that is the first time there's been some uh, a meaningful uptick in, in activity in that region. They both are horizontal rigs targeting oil production. So when we think about the Williston Basin, our oil infrastructure, our natural gas infrastructure, we share that with these neighboring states. So again, what happens uh, in eastern Montana will impact us here in North Dakota as far as the transportation processing dynamics and all that. So we'll keep a close eye on it and we'll see if that continues to, to trickle upwards. Um, if so, you know, Montana, uh, they've got some drilling opportunities over there as well. So uh, we'll keep a close eye on that. South Dakota is still sitting at uh, zero rigs. Slide three, again, not much to show here. You have to squint to, to see the changes month to month, uh, so we won't focus too much on that. Slide four, uh, we did see some shifting around of how barrels are being moved out of North Dakota. We saw uh, a couple percentage points increase in the amount of uh, crude oil leaving by pipeline versus by rail. Um, on slide five, you can see uh, again some of that that longer term trend. The one thing that that stuck out to me right away was 
uh, that shrinking of the WTI Brent spread. That's that blue dotted line on this graphic. So with that dropping down, I believe it was sub $2 in the month of June. And then subsequently we saw a retraction as well in the amount of crude by rail leaving as some of those incentives went away. From a, a volume perspective on slide six, you're looking at right around 160 uh, or so, 100,000 uh, barrels uh, per day leaving by rail car. Um, down noticeably from right around 200,000 barrels per day in the, the May time frame. Where we're seeing those barrels go again, this the, the destination information is lagged an extra month, uh, what comes from the EIA. Uh, but if you remember last month, it was shocking a bit of, of the difference between what was going to the West Coast, the Pacific Northwest, and what was going East. We have seen that shrink here a little bit in the month of May. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to watch this again. I don't anticipate massive changes though going forward. I think we're going to continue to see the Pacific Northwest continue to be the dominant uh, destination for North Dakota's crude by rail out of the region. When we look at pricing in May, uh, again, if you look at that pad one versus pad five, so the east and the west coasts, uh, you can see about a buck fifty higher uh, pricing out of the east coast. It does cost a little bit more to get out from North Dakota to the east coast, uh, but uh, again, and the other dynamic going east is you need to change carriers as well, typically halfway through your, your route. So it does cost a little bit more, uh, but I think that long term that Pacific Northwest will continue to be our, our dominant destination. Um, I made one little tweak on this graphic, just looking at today's pricing. I added the Clearbrook uh, pricing on there as well. As you can see, uh, the, the Enbridge system, I don't have the pipelines on this particular map, but for those that are not familiar with Clearbrook, uh, the Enbridge system that exits North Dakota either through Minot and East or going up through Cromer and then onto the mainline system of Enbridge uh, comes to a terminal known as uh, Clearbrook, Minnesota. Uh, and that's one of the first uh, major marketing points for North Dakota's oil as it heads towards the Great Lakes and the, the mid-continent area. And so historically, uh, there's typically a negative sign associated with that. So, you know, here in 2021, for much of the year, it's been very positive uh, price environment for North Dakota. We've been averaging in North Dakota on a whole right around a six dollar discount to WTI uh, compared to several years ago when we were looking at eight to be a typical type number. So pricing has been relatively strong. Clearbrook has been strong. Um, having again uh, Dakota access and the expansion that was just announced, having that direct connection down to the Gulf Coast, all of those things have been boding uh, very well for for North Dakota's netbacks and. You know, as North Dakota continues to position itself for ramping up growth here later this year and then into next year, um, you know, folks recognize uh, the position we're in uh, from a positive standpoint with crude oil transportation, the netbacks, all of that uh, in very, very good shape for North Dakota, which is encouraging. Slide 10, import exports, very little change. I won't uh, dig in too far there. Um, as Lynn alluded to, um, from a percentage basis, almost identical. Uh, the, the, this pie chart did not look any different last month than it did this month. Uh, still the same type of challenges with uh, gas flowing from wells that are connected or gathering systems, uh, continuing to be the dominant challenge in the region. And, and I anticipate that will continue to be that way for the foreseeable future. Slide 12, again, that's just the historic look. And then uh, we'll bump forward to slide 13. Some positive news here as well. Again, getting more wells connected to gas sales than new wells producing gas. So whenever that black line is above the, the red, that's a good situation for a gas capture. However, if those gathering lines that those wells are getting connected into are full, it, it mutes a bit the, the impact of that. So it's encouraging to see the, the connections happening. Uh, but you know, as Lynn mentioned, you know, Dakota is going to need some additional uh, major expansions in the region. Uh, the EIA did adjust their oil price out outlook. Um, they they brought it down slightly um, here in the next uh, two to three years, dropping it below sixty dollars for a short period of time before starting to ramp back up again. So. Similar, but uh, slightly slightly lower on their outlook for oil prices here in the US. And then slide 15, this is getting to that, uh, the comments Linda made and what I just referenced. When we look at 
the expected growth for natural gas production in North Dakota, um, even with flattish or relatively modest growth in, in oil production because of the way that these uh, wells perform over time, I am anticipating very strong growth in the natural gas side. So for, for the dry gas, the methane, but then the natural gas liquids as well. And so even though it looks on this graphic like we've got you know, more than 18 to 24 months of, of time frame before those lines extend out into the white period. Um, in reality, we've found that you need to have surplus processing the capacity in, in North Dakota. You can't have a one for one, you know, on paper relationship just because of the way that you know, the reality is out in the field of where wells are, where the processing plants are. And so depending upon some of the metrics I look at, Again, that, that sticks us in that two-year window where we'll, we'll need expansions done uh, in that two-year time frame in order to keep pace with this growth, growth curve. Then looking at northern border, uh, North Dakota's market share there has continued to hover right around that 75% uh, market share in northern border. Uh, the BTU numbers are continuing to stay below that 1100 level. Uh, we're continuing to see uh, some of our processing facilities in North Dakota extract ethane and send that ethane down into the Bushton, Kansas, as well down to the Mount Bellevue uh, marketplace. Uh, right now, there's some some market incentives and some uh, transportation incentives being offered by the the midstream companies to make that happen. Uh, but again, long term, we still anticipate that this BTU challenge is going to be an issue, uh, particularly as we move into next year and and the ramp up in the the overall volume growth in North Dakota. Uh, so with that, I'll, I will stop and answer any questions. Yes. The, um, is it the outrigger plant that's, that's taking the gas? How is that accomplished? Did there have to be a waiver of any kind of federal rules to do that or? Nothing. So the question for those online was uh, the, the, the shifting of gas volume from the title of the plant um, over to the outrigger facility. And so how it's taking place, I'm not aware that any federal actions needed to, to take place. It, it had to, obviously commercial arrangements had to happen between Hess and, and the Outrigger folks. Um, that was the first time Outrigger had, had brought their new plant online. It was completed um, a while back and had been sitting idle. And so it was encouraging to see that, that facility then come online in, in a crucial time. Um, I remember a number of years ago when Hess went down for, for one of their turnarounds and it was an immediate uptick you could see in the numbers and in, in flaring in North Dakota. So it, it's encouraging that this time around it, it's much different than it was in the past. And so that plant now is, is operating. Um, the liquids are connected to one oak for handling the natural gas liquids. They've got a direct connection to northern border. So that they're, they're well positioned to uh, help solve the problem that otherwise would have been there if they weren't able to take that gas. And that just, just for to refresh my memory, What's the plant capacity at Outrigger and then what's the plant capacity going to be at Tioga? So Outrigger is a 250 million uh, a day plant and then Hess will ramp up. So they were at 250 and they're going up to 400 when that's completed. So they, they went in turn around in about mid July and they were expecting that to be about a 45 day turnaround. Yep. Um, just dovetailing off of um, Dave's question. Um, Projecting out a year and a half or two years, do we have the projects lined up right now to um, to uh, keep within the, the flaring or the gas capture goals? Um, or, or does North Dakota need to kind of track more projects and more infrastructure over that period of time um, to, to avoid missing those benchmarks? Yeah, good question. So again, to repeat for those online, it was you know, essentially how well is North Dakota positioned to meet uh, those those production curves that you can see on slide you know, 15. And so it's encouraging because it, you know, I regularly meet with the, the players that are involved in, in putting together that infrastructure. Um, when you when I look at what the needs are, it is all the way from the wellhead to essentially the, the consumer. Um, there is for the long term growth in North Dakota's oil production. Um, every segment will need to expand all the way from the wellhead to the gathering, processing, uh, residue transmission, natural gas liquids transmission. Um, it's not going to be an easy feat. I know the right companies are looking at it right now and are, are making plans um, to, to address it. Um, it. The conversations kind of shifted from a 
not if but when scenario you know whether it's two years what does that time frame look like and, and how do you scale it up appropriately uh, but uh, things will have to get moving relatively briskly in, in order to uh, meet those those type of time frames well price is helping that the natural gas price last month was up i didn't look at it to today is up yeah um, uh, natural gas prices, natural gas liquids prices, yes, are all in, in real good shape right now. Um, and one thing that I'm going to be watching, and, and we can talk about this in coming months, uh, the propane situation. There's been a lot of uh, reporting here just recently and in industry analysts and concerns about propane stocks in the U.S. and especially for a, a state like North Dakota as we move forward. Uh, we'll keep a close eye on that and what the inventory levels look like and what some of those impacts uh, could be for those folks in North Dakota. Um, changing the subject a bit, I thought I'd ask you about Dakota Access. Um, since Energy Transfer announced at the start of the month that you know that pipeline is indeed expanding, yep. um, have you heard much in terms of like whether a lot of barrels are indeed shifting onto Dakota Access that weren't previously? Uh, so the, the question was, do we have any color yet about what's happened with Dakota Access and that expansion and, and whether barrels are shifting? I suspect, and, and I don't have any hard data right now to back it up, but that some barrels are shifting um, onto uh, that uh, expansion. And so whether they're pulling barrels off of legacy pipeline systems or pulling barrels off of rail, I think we'll likely see a mix of both. Um, again, the Gulf Coast um, you know, is, a, is a premium destination. And when shippers have you know have booked you know firm transportation or an expansion when that comes online typically those barrels need to show up um, in order to um, meet their meet their contract terms so but i think in a couple months we'll start to see the the data shake out about where those barrels are coming from if they're being pulled off other pipelines or being pulled off a rail um and then i also wanted to ask about the rigs in montana um I can't recall how often Montana does have rigs operating. Is that somewhat rare? Uh, not. It's been rare in recent years um, when when prices have have suffered. Obviously, Montana. When you think of the Williston Basin, you know they they do have the Bakken system, and they've had you know fairly good success in the past. Um, the economics are not as strong as North Dakota, um, but there are some producers that don't have acreage positions in North Dakota. All they have is Montana, and so they can they can still make it work at, at even these price levels in Montana. So I'm not surprised to see the rigs there, um, but I don't know how much growth we should reasonably expect here until you know prices may get a little bit higher in the future and, and drive more activity that direction. Did Montana have um, zero rigs uh, until, I don't know what month it was, I guess this month that- Yeah, so last month uh, they were at zero. Um, historically, they've, you know, when, when North Dakota was really humming, I mean, they'd have a handful, maybe 10 mm -hmm. dozen rigs or so over there, but- yeah, I, I think this is the first time this year that they've had any rigs. I, I think they've been at zero since the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. And do you happen to know where the rigs are in Montana? Is it kind of in the Bakken area, like, like Sydney, Fairview, that area, or is it other parts of eastern Montana? I would suspect. I, did, I didn't look at the, the map of where they, exactly they were, but they're horizontal oil, which would indicate to me that they're going to be yeah, somewhere west of, of Williams County there, west of Mackenzie County. Yeah. Just an odd follow-up on the last time that uh, South Dakota's Harding County had a rig. That I don't recall. <laughs> and that... <laughs> I don't have that. I'd have to look back. <laughs> yep. Uh, maybe you should ask this when Lynn was up, but um, wondering if uh, there's any concerns right now about how great the concerns are about impacts of the Delta variant on oil prices and um, new activity here. You know, certainly the, the so the question was about the Delta variant. I know um, I don't know that I'm certainly not the expert on that and what are are aware of what's happening with Asian demand and um, global demand and supply. So you know, certainly the Delta variant right now is priced in because I mean the market recognizes it. Um, you know it's where it's going to go. Uh, you know if it continues to, to impact demand at a global scale, then then that 
could make prices suffer. I mean, that, that that's the supply and demand with OPEC bringing production on if demand, and they were bringing on production in anticipation of growing uh, demand here over the next year. Uh, but if if the Delta variant mutes that that demand growth, then then prices may suffer as a result. So, so we're actually seeing a significant number of Chinese refineries come back online. So they appear to have worked through it, if if anything at all. And so Asian demand seems to be on the increase. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. All right, thank you. We're going to end now. Thanks.